Yeah, thank you. First of all, it's a great pleasure and honor. Uh, absolutely delighted and very exciting <laughs> to see a variety of people. And um, this is our chance to kind of share our excitement about uh, mathematics and whatever we do. <laughs> so in that sense, um, um, I mean, um, it's a great opportunity for me as well. So as Amit said, um, you could talk to me um, maybe after the talk. Um, during the talk also you can disturb me, except that I think I, I have perhaps in my excitement I have prepared quite a bit. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, we can always talk here. We are here. And as he said, you can always you know, also um, on my email and so on. And since he mentioned about Bhavana, I'll just want to just say that some of you may not have maybe unlucky to get the copy, hard copy. Uh, let me just write down the web address where it is freely available uh, in the sense that it's open access. Yeah. OK. All right, yeah. So I'll begin with the talk. First of all, uh, I thought I will um, thank ICTS. <laughs> um, the talk is about tiling. And uh, the reason why I wanted to thank ICTS this way is because uh, some of you might recognize that this tiling, this tile, is actually a proof of Pythagoras theorem. And this particular one of the tiles, one of this, this thing is part of ICTS logo. <laughs> OK, so tiling and ICTS. OK, so I thought I'll begin the talk a little, <laughs> you know. Um, so this is a quotation. Uh, this is a saying by one of the greatest mathematicians India produced. Um, he's, the, he's the best uh, known mathematician India has produced since Ramanujan. His name is Harish Chandra. And uh, yeah, uh, not many people know about him. Uh, so I thought, anyway, it's also more than that. I mean, he, he was a um, uh, he was very well known. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that was his. That is his saying. So I mean, because uh, one of the things that Harish Chandra tried to say is that math, we always somehow think of it as applying to something. It's of course that's one of the thing, but math also has its own intrinsic art value <laughs> in the sense that certain questions you ask and you try to answer just because of curiosity. <laughs> OK? Uh, you may not really know why it's interesting, but somehow you find it interesting and you want to answer the question, or at least. And uh, so you start uh, you know, asking a question and trying to answer it. And then you will realize when you actually get into research life, answering questions is not very easy. And I think uh, a typical researcher will be stuck most of the time. <laughs> so nevertheless, uh, it's curiosity, and it's a lifelong endeavor. Um, and uh, the art part of mathematics, in the sense that how it relates to things beyond just applications, I think Harish Chandra tried to say in this nice saying, I thought it was quite nice. In mathematics, there is an empty canvas before you which can be filled without reference to external reality. And I thought I'll put another quote, <laughs> just because I'm talking about patterns. This is a quotation from GHRD, who really wrote uh, very uh, you know, eloquently, um, and also he's best known as Ramanujan's discover, but a discoverer. He's also a great mathematician himself, and uh, he played a key role in actually getting back the math mathematics into the mainstream in England itself. <laughs> um, so he says that, uh, like a painter or a poet, is a maker of patterns, and if his patterns are more permanent than theirs, it's because they are made with ideas. <laughs> ideas like the colors or the words must fit together in a harmonious way. And in this talk, when I talk about tiling, I'll give several examples. Then you will really understand that there, is, there are these colors, there are these hidden patterns and hidden uh, mechanisms that you want to understand. So let me, let's start tiling, <laughs> OK? Uh, get to the business. Um, so tiling, as you know, I mean, people tile. And for instance, here itself on this, in this floor, you already see square tiles, yeah? And, uh, so naturally, tiling, everyone Mason knows when you have to tile, naturally you have to fit things in such a way that there are no gaps and there's no overlapping. Right? It will be flat. So by the way, I mean, uh, this talk uh, is not going to be very technical in the sense that, you know, I mean, I might, um, you know, some of the experts might find very elementary, but at the same time, 
All I require is just if you know, I mean, so many people say that I do not know anything beyond adding and multiplication in mathematics, and that's all that I need for this whole talk. I don't need anything else. <laughs> okay, so, so technically, I mean, when you have to make the requirement, namely without overlapping and um, without, without leaving gaps and without overlapping, so whenever you put the tiles around each corner, the angle has to be 360 degrees, because angle around a point is 360 degrees, which all of us know, study in high school geometry. And usually we use a you know, radian measure after you know, get to the PUC. So I, or two pi radians, okay? I use the two pi, that kind of uh, unit uh, in this talk. And suppose when you want a tile, like in this particular floor, you only find the square tiles, yeah? So when you, Regular polygons means, I mean, polygons uh, whose sides uh, uh, length are the same, as well as the angles are also the same. Um, so interior angles, I mean. Um, the regular polygon, if you had to use, if you say I, I are allowed to use only one type of regular polygon, it's very easy to see that uh, when you have an equilateral triangle, you put six of them, so you get 360 around a point. Then you start with square. Square also does it, because 90 degrees, you put four of them. And then when you come to pentagon, uh, interior angle, I will not ask you. <laughs> I'll just give you an answer. It's 108. <laughs> so, well, I mean, around a tile, you have to put at least, around a point, at least three tiles you need to put. But then three times 108 will fall short of 360. And if you put four, it will overlap. So it's not going to tile. Whereas when you come to hexagon, the most popular uh, tile that you would see, uh, you, you, it meets the criterion. And when you go beyond, because hexagon has 120, so if you put three of them, it's already 360. And sides so seven and beyond, naturally, uh, interior angle will always, you know, three of them will always overlap. So you, you won't have that, only three types. So I thought I will put this picture. And this talk, basically, I try to talk through pictures. <laughs> That's the whole uh, point of geometry. Uh, in mathematics, uh, most people associate mathematics with numbers. <laughs> And mathematics is not just about numbers. Geometry and uh, patterns and the beauty, the symmetry and so on. So that's uh, what I want to say. So I'll have put, put a lot of pictures. And the, I want the pictures to speak so the ideas for, are formed in your minds. <laughs> okay, so now with single kind of polygon, uh, you only have three choices and nothing else as we saw. We, we, we even saw a proof of that. So now you try to put combination of regular polygons. And you see such tilings also, because you know people want novelty. I mean, three is too small a number to kind of you know <laughs> play around with. You need more variety. <laughs> so as a result, you say combination of polygons. Again, the criterion is the same. Around a point, the angle has to be 360. And since you know the interior angles, you see which criterions make. And actually, when you work out the arithmetic, easy arithmetic, there are about 21 possibilities. Only, but only eight more of them. So totally 11 tile the plane. And when I mention all this, it just means three triangles and four squares. I mean, it's, it's not a three to the power three. It's not that way at all. The notation means it's a three triangles. As you see, one, two, three triangles and four square two, uh, two I mean, uh, two uh, squares, yeah? And this notation basically means around each vertex, around each corner point, you have three triangles and two, word, two, two squares, yeah? So that's the kind of criterion. So for instance, here, this one of those, I, I, my favorite is this actually. And so around each point you see one square, one hexagon, one uh, 12 gun, yeah, four, six, 12. And if you notice this, um, the co combination of regular polygons used are all very different, except that this one and this one use the same number of triangles and same number of squares. Except that, I mean, the vertex, around vertex, the arrangement is slightly different, yeah. That's about it, yeah. So this is, this is all that you get. <laughs> and what do I mean by saying there are 21 possibilities, but only eight of them? So what happens to other possibilities? Why can't one do? It just does work out. So I'll just say easy arithmetic. Uh, you understand that, but I'll just, I thought I'll quickly uh, you know, sketch how, the, how it's done. So basically, interior angle of each regular k-sided polygon is uh, this uh, number, and uh, that's how I write. So I just take the factor 2 pi out, and I'll just, uh, you know, so if uh, n different polygons, uh, one of them with k1 sides, like one of them with three sides, another one with four sides, and so on, have to meet and add up to a full term, namely 2 pi this thing. So it just this is the criterion, because the interior angle is this times 2 pi. So I just took the 2 pi common. And this is the you get an equation like this. And you just have to kind of um, 
work with this equation. This equation gives you finitely many constraints. I'll just mention one of them, namely that I said n is the number of polygons that you use in this tiling, right? And n cannot be more than 6, because each polygon, the minimum side is 3, so triangle already has 60 degrees. So if I put 6 of triangles, the minimum one, you already get to 360, so you can't, you know, n is already, has to be less than or equal to 6. That's why in the previous slide when I showed the Archimedean tiling, you saw maximum was 5 there. Yeah, because uh, 6 is already realized by the triangle, and which I discussed earlier, okay? So this is as simple as that, okay? So now I mentioned uh, that one of the possibilities is this, um, two pentagons and a decagon. So in fact, interior angles add up to 360. If I put two pentagons and two regular pentagons, regular, I'm only talking about regular at the moment. All sides equal and all angles equal, okay? So, well, it meets that equation. And Kepler, Johann Kepler, tried <laughs> to do the tiling. And uh, so he, he tried to arrange things, but I said, okay, if I'm, I, don't, I don't succeed, let's say, and see, you can see two pentagons and a decagon here, you know, 10-sided polygon. You can put all this here, but when you start putting things out, you get these nice looking stars. Basically, stars uh, just get gaps, basically. And then he said, okay, I'll proceed, and then you see some two decagons overlapping. <laughs> well, he couldn't do anything, but he perhaps thought that this is a nice picture, so he included it in his book. <laughs> okay? And the, this is the beauty. The beauty is the following. In mathematics, when you don't succeed, it's not the end of the road. It, it, it can be an inspiration for some really, really beautiful, nice theorem. And I'll come back to this picture later, maybe towards, almost towards the end, perhaps. I'll come back to this picture, how it inspired one of the most uh, nice, brilliant discoveries in tiling uh, in the last century. <laughs> okay, I'll come back to this. So one lesson I want to say is that if you didn't succeed, it's all right. You didn't succeed because that was how it was. <laughs> it was not in your hands to succeed. <laughs> but then it may have, it, if it has some beauty that seems, you see some inherent beauty, it might be appealing. Well, we'll discover it later. Or maybe you, you may not be able to discover, but this picture might inspire somebody in a later generation. So it's a continuing activity, <laughs> okay? So I'll come back to this picture. It looks quite like an art, and actually, I mean, some places you could see some of the window sills, window, and, and the arch curving, and so on. You can see some grills, similar to this, <laughs> not exactly this. Yeah. Okay, so talking about art, I thought I'll use <laughs> tiling, tessellation. One of the brilliant uh, Dutch artists uh, called uh, M.C. Escher. If you, uh, I don't know how many of you are really familiar with Escher. His paintings, uh, really, he took on many of the mathematical ideas and tried to you know, uh, do it in his uh, pictures. And not only paintings, but he also had uh, three-dimensional kind of models, what called woodcut figures. And in the exhibition that Amit just mentioned, uh, The Mathematics of the Planet Earth, we had many of the exhibits with uh, carrying um, uh, Escher's, uh, you know, tessellation uh, art, as well as a nice woodcut, uh, one big exhibit we had. <laughs> and um, so, uh, anyway, all that, by the way, I mean, even that is available on the web, uh, the, all of our exhibits and uh, so on. So. I would, I, now that we, we have talked about it, I strongly urge you to go and look at it so that you will get some ideas, yeah? So, he, and basically he was just using the usual tessellation pattern and he tried to find interesting things, <laughs> fish in between birds and so on. This is one of the art, yeah, Escher. And if you visit Escher homepage or any book that you see, it's really fascinating. You just see pictures and pictures and you suddenly kind of understand, oh, or at least realize that there is so much beauty in art, yeah? <laughs> And he tried to bring out the mathematical beauty in art. Okay, so that's not the only thing about tiling. And tiling also helps in other fields, uh, in understanding uh, in physics and chemistry and so on, as we will see. So, actually, uh, things are made of atoms, as we see, and you have this material, uh, you have the so-called crystalline material, we see crystals. And when you actually see crystals, there is some basic unit kind of thing which are all put together. And how do you understand what is this basic unit <laughs> and how are they put together? So uh, they have certain kind of symmetries. Uh, we have seen some crystals and crystals display some symmetries. How do we understand this? 
One way to understand is like you, naturally when we see crystals, if it's kind of, if there's a light passing through it, you will see certain nice dots around. And it's, it's quite fascinating, yeah. So this is what called the diffraction patterns. You through, see through an electron microscope, the light is flashed and you see because the crystal has, basically crystal is like you have several of these polygons and so on meeting at you know, in, in, in funny angles or whatever different angles. And these diffraction patterns, um, uh, uh, you know, because the in interference, interference patterns, you see these um, dots, the, these are called the Bragg peaks. And when you see this Bragg peak, for instance, this is a diffraction pattern of one of the crystals, you definitely see squares, right? It's a square tiling as we see here. So in a sense, the symmetry of that crystal, you understand via the tiling pattern because you, you look at the tiling and see the symmetries. And for instance, this one is, uh, you have an octagon. This is not a regular octagon, but an act octagon. And uh, if you put, you know, four of these, let's say around this corner, you will see a square. Square and octagon, one of the Archimedean tilings. So, so it's a way to understand. So crystallography basically has a lot of group theory, as we call it in mathematics. And uh, that's how it plays a role. And tiling, uh, then you can sort of classify crystals according to the tiling that we have just seen, yeah? Some kind of symmetries, that's one way you understand. So now, I'm talking about tiling, and uh, my title said footloose. <laughs> so I keep kind of uh, you know, moving around uh, topics, and it's almost like I'm going on a trek, and um, there are so lots of things. I need to go, and I want to climb this hill, but then there's so, so much beauty around, I just want to kind of see around, and you know, <laughs> I do want to spend a little time um, pondering on things and uh, observing, and. Reaching the top of the hill is not, is not my aim. It's one of my aims, but you know, enjoying around. So, so I have in my topics tiling. It's basically tiling. It has polygons, but it also has some nice things here. Yeah. So pentagons, I said, we cannot tile, regular pentagons. So well, I mean, three pentagons, if you put it, it's less than 360. So naturally, there's a gap. So what do you do? You bend and make boxes. <laughs> so you make boxes. And when you make boxes out of regular polygons, so these are so-called platonic solids, regular solids. This is made of equilateral triangles, four equilateral triangles. If you put four of them, uh, yeah, it's less than 360, so you have this. And 90 into 3, that's also less than 360, you have this. It's the standard cube that you see. And you put four of the triangles, you get this, what's called octahedron. And pentagons, with regular pentagons, you get this beautiful structure. Do dodecahedron. Among all platonic solids, somehow this is my favorite. Um, in fact, many people have an art, uh, you know, they uh, usually, uh, some of the artistic lamps have this pentagonal structure. <laughs> um, and then there is this ecosahedron. This has, uh, you know, at each vertex it has four equilateral triangles. See, when we looked at the polygons, when we went to hexagon, already if you put three hexagons, uh, it's 360, it's flat, so you can't make boxes out of hexagons. I mean, only hexagons. But then anything less than that, you could make. So pentagon, you can make only one, because if you put four of them, it's already beyond four, 360. And if you put four of the squares, again, it's 360, so only one using square and one using pentagon. But you can create three boxes out of uh, triangles, and uh, that's all. <laughs> so existence and uniqueness, these are five fundamental solids. And Greeks also associated, like in Indian philosophy, we have, or what, not philosophy, Indian culture, panchabhuta, you know, air, water, and so on, they also had that kind of significance. For instance, I think this tetrahedron signified fire. <laughs> Greeks had associated fire, uh, earth, and so on for each of them, actually. So you make boxes. <laughs> OK, so now with regular uh, polygons, you made boxes. There were five of them. Only five were possible, and we have made all the five. OK. So now let's use combinations of polygons. OK, when you use combination of poly combinations of polygons, they're called Archimedean solids. This is Archimedean tiles. So. Regular polygons, only three kind of tiles we had. And combination of polygons, I had 11, I mean, eight more. So similarly, I had five, and I have some 13 more. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, 13 more boxes. These are the various boxes you can make. For instance, this you would have seen in the sphere, you would have seen this in the football. So well, anyway, there are these names given to all that. I thought they looked beautiful, <laughs> it's colorful. 
And the thing is that many compounds, chemical compounds, uh, you know, the fundamental unit is some of these things, and I think carbon-60 was um, uh, on this buckyball, I think. That's what they're also called, buck, because Buckminster Fuller, right? Yeah, Fuller in here. So that, uh, this is a ball. So this is all that you can make, boxes. And boxes, styles, everything play a role in my talk, yeah. Okay, I thought let me just do a little bit of counting. Uh, since uh, people said at least they know counting, <laughs> I thought I'll put some counting. And this is one aspect of mathematics. So, so counting. So you have the, uh, the, the whole, all these boxes. Let me just go back one slide. All these boxes. Basically, if you look at it, what are they made of? They're made of polygons. And each polygon is made of uh, edges and corners. So corners is what we mathematically just call vertices and uh, edges and faces. And uh, each of them, I'll just start doing some kind of counting. So each of the polyhedron, each of the box, which fanc fancily we call polyhedron, uh, the vertices, vertex, called co corner is the vertex, and the edges, and you just look at the numbers. And for fun, you just look at this expression. Number of vertices, number of corners, and you have number of edges and number of faces. All you do is a nice small arithmetic here. And when you do this, <laughs> it turns out to be exactly two. So for instance, let's look at this hall, <laughs> okay? So one, two, three, four, five. Sorry, I start going. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six, we have six of these. So you can just count all these things and look at this expression, you will get two. So let me just say, you can, now that I said mathematics also imagine. So you imagine staying in a kind of uh, a cubicle lecture hall. So a cubicle lecture hall will have uh, four corners below, four corners at the top, so eight corners. And the number of edges would be four below, and four on top, eight, and four on the wall, so 12. So you had uh, eight minus 12, eight minus 12 is uh, four. And then how many faces you have? Uh, you have four walls, four walls as we say, four walls and the base and the top, six. So eight minus six is two, okay? You do this counting for each of the box, and you get all the time just two. So this is a theorem. This, this is an observation and the theorem of Euler. So that's why it's called the Euler number. Leonard Euler is the 18th century Swiss mathematician. By the way, the proof is also not really hard. Basically, proof is not hard basically because when you just look at one polygon, let's say one square, one square has four corners and four edges and one face. So if you do this number, you'll get one. And to make a box, basically, you have to put one more. <laughs> you know, you don't add any of this thing, one more. It's, 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 it's the basic fact is just that for a, any polygon, Euler number is just one. And that, you know, you just can inductively do that. It's, it's a nice thing, yeah, nice exercise. This is all the mathematics I'm going to say. I think further all, only pictures, I think, yeah. So I thought it's not just those box. I said, I mean, all, not only those um, regular platonic solids, uh, but also, I said, Archimedean solids, any box that you do, which is hollow inside. So for instance, if you look at this pyramid, uh, it's a square pyramid. So it has four below and one top, five. And edges is four plus four, eight, right? Because it's a square pyramid. It's a square pyramid we are talking about, eight. So five minus eight is uh, minus uh, three. And then uh, how many faces? One, two, three, four plus five. So it's two, five minus three is two. So I got two. So every time you get two, <laughs> okay? Sometimes you succeed, and whatever box you take, you always get two. <laughs> and that's a nice theorem. <laughs> and actually, in other words, what it says is any box which is hollow inside, the number two is an invariant. <laughs> so this is a nice theorem, yeah? This is called the Euler number. So you can do any, any box that you see, if you want to convince, you can do that, but you can actually, as I said, you can mathematically prove it as a theorem. It will not go wrong forever. Okay, so now I thought I'll come back to polygon stylings uh, after that brief, uh, this thing about boxes. I'll again come back to boxes later. As I said, you know, I keep encountering boxes here and there. So now, uh, let's look at irregular polygons. By irregular, I mean, I, I'm, now I allow myself to change the length of the sides of the polygon. And I also allow myself to change the angles and so on. So that's what irregular is about. And convex is just a word in the sense that there are no dents kind of thing here. We, we, as I said, I will not define anything. You will understand, <laughs> okay? Yeah, because if I start getting to mathematical definition, you will not. But anyway, you will see the pictures, yeah, what it, uh, when I see something. So irregular polygons. Let me start with triangles. 
Okay, earlier I started with equilateral triangle. Now I will have any triangle. Any triangle meaning, I mean, the side lengths could be anything, the interior angles could be anything. Can I tile? And it turns out that it's not hard at all, it's very easy. <laughs> That's basically because you study in Euclidean geometry that the sum of the three interior angles of a triangle is 180, and that usually helps us quite a bit here. So if I, if some, if I take this as a basic triangle, all I do is, along one of the sides, I flip and put it here. So which means when I look at it, it looks, it's a parallelogram. <laughs> okay? It's a parallelogram. And what is interesting is that uh, because it's a parallelogram, and uh, so the angle here, uh, I, I had this triangle here, right? And uh, so the angle around this turns out to be 180, basically because you have used all the three angles, right? I mean, here, and this angle is reflecting here, and this angle is coming here. So it's 180. And, and an, an, another way to look at it is you have this here, and this here, and I have this line falling on it. And this interior angle, if I sum again, it's 180. And uh, if you studied Euclid's parallel postulate, it tells you that sort of if I have two lines and another line falling on it, and you look at the interior angles, if the ang interior angles is exactly equal to two right angles, then the two lines that you started with, if you just extend them indefinitely, they will never meet. That's a parallel axiom. So that's, so it's the parallel. So, and you know, taking a par parallelogram also, you can tessellate. You can, Tessellation is another word that we use for tiling. So tiles, you can have a parallelogram tiles also. I think one sees parallelogram tiles also sometimes, yeah. So now let's look at con convex quadrilaterals. So triangles, any triangle. So, so I mean, you can take, pick your favorite triangle <laughs> and you can tile your home uh, with the favorite triangle. So quadrilaterals, so convex quadrilaterals. I mean, just since I'm asking everything in the realm of convex quadrilaterals for, you know, uh, for convenience. And good news, <laughs> good news is that just like triangle, any quadrilateral, <laughs> I said convex and I said, oh, convex, even if it's not convex also it works. Basically, the, uh, the reason why it works is because any quadrilateral, if you take the sum of the interior angles is 360 and that plays a role here because 360 was what you wanted to get. <laughs> and you take any quadrilateral, <laughs> Okay, any quadrilateral like this. So just basically have to arrange cleverly, flip around, so that around each corner you get all the four angles of the quadrilateral, which you knew is 360, so 360 really does it. Okay, and the same logic works here. So by the way, when I said convex quadrilateral, I said, you know, convex polygons. So for instance, this is a convex polygon, because if I take any two points inside and draw the line, it right inside the quadrilateral. Whereas here, this is not a convex polygon, because if I take these two points and draw a straight line, it's right outside it. That's, the, that's, that's what the definition of convexity is. Uh, you don't need to remember, but this is fine, yeah, this picture is fine. So there also, because some of the interior angles is 360, it works. So any quadril, quadrilateral does. Great, no? So let's, I jump to hexagons now, for similar reason, because pentagon is one of the most beautiful, beautiful objects, and it's beautiful in the sense that it, it gives you a lot of research problems. <laughs> and I think if you are a mathematician trying to do research, you always need problems, and problems you want to work and spend lifetime with. <laughs> okay, so, so I'll come back to pentagons later. Hexagons. And uh, so I thought I'll show this picture. Whenever one talks about regular hexagons, um, uh, this uh, honeycomb uh, is a regular hexagon. Uh, the nature has done it, yeah? So I don't need to say more. And honeycomb has a very interesting thing, by the way. Uh, I'll, I'll just mention that. So it's hexagon from here, fine. How are the boxes inside? How are the things inside? So it's, it's not a hexagonal prism completely. Uh, the bottom, the bottom of this uh, hexagonal prism thing is basically like, uh, when you had this pencil, uh, I don't know, these days everyone perhaps uses computer, we used to have pencil. <laughs> pencil usually have to have a hexagonal, uh, you know, the shape. And when you, when you used to, you know, if you didn't use the usual, uh, what's called the uh, menda, blade, you could just along the, each of the parallel ridge, three planes you cut, okay? So you have hexagons and then the three planes. I'll, I'll show you a picture later, yeah, I'll show you a picture. So that's, the, that's how the bottom is, it's not a, it's not a flat bottom. And that's, that's very efficient, actually. <laughs> so I thought I'll mention one of the open problems. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, one of the problems is open for a very long time, 
as long as uh, the problem was uh, mentioned uh, sometime in 36 BCE, <laughs> before Christian era, and it was solved only in 1999, <laughs> mathematically, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so it's not only lifetime, it's across generations, okay? <laughs> That's how mathematics problems are, and actually we are living in a very fantastic time because in the last couple of centuries, many, many 2,000-year-old problems have been solved, and in the last century, even 100-year-old problems have been solved, hundreds of years, Fermat's last theorem, Poincaré conjecture, and so on. And it's a very exciting time to be living in. <laughs> so you can understand the excitement mathematicians can have, yeah? So anyway, so coming back to this, so it was mentioned by Greek. You know, Greeks really, really studied uh, geometry, and they really took on the idea aspect, and uh, beyond uh, just applications and so on, just the curiosity of the sums, angles, and so on. They proved remarkable theorems. I think the Greeks achieved a very high level of geometric sophistication. And uh, so, so you can look at the partition of the plane, meaning we, we talked about already the hexagonal tiling. Hexagonal tiling and uh, you know, the, the honeybees <laughs> making, it's no wonder uh, why it's so efficient in the sense that uh, when you tile, so each tile has a certain whatever shape and a certain area. So when we have tiled in such a way, that, I mean, uh, tiled, so which means each has a certain area, which, which, which means we have actually broken up or partitioned our floor into units of equal area. And when I look at the edge length and sum all of the edge length, what's called the perimeter, okay, I want to do a nice thing in the sense that when I choose the tile, I want the area to be maximum given a certain perimeter. So I'm given some perimeter, and I want you to choose a ch tile whose area is maximum. So, in that sense, hexagon actually, that's what was conjectured by Varro. And I think he stated like, somewhat like this, uh, hexagon encloses the greatest amount of space. Uh, that's uh, his wording, I think, or at least in translation. Uh, and uh, what he says, any partition into regions of equal area has a perimeter, at least that of hexagonal, which means hexagon is the, is the one which optimizes. So the honeybee solution is quite optimal. <laughs> Okay, and this is another recurring theme uh, in my lecture. It's the first of the time in the sense that, you know, you also observe nature, how nature has solved some things, and that might really give you a lot of insights. And this is proven by Thomas Hales. This is not the honeycomb conjecture. Maybe it was initially called honeycomb conjecture. Only for convex? Huh? Convex polygons? Ah, uh, no, all polygons. That's the beauty here. That's the beauty here. Yeah, hexagons among all of them. Yeah, convex, non-convex, that's the optimal, yeah. And the proof is, uh, as in, in mathematics, as we normally say, proof is elementary but not simple. <laughs> what we mean by elementary not simple in the sense that, elementary in the sense that it doesn't really very require sophisticated mathematics, whatever we have done. <laughs> but you need to look at some limits and various things. It's not, sim it's not simple in that sense, but it's elementary. Things that you have studied in your master's course, if you really look at the paper, you can definitely understand the proof. Uh, that, uh, I mean, definitely understand the proof, it def definitely requires some hard work for sure. <laughs> it's not without hard work. And it's a hard work which is enjoyable if you really are, you know, wanting to understand the proof. So it's in all this thing, yeah, that's the thing. Uh, uh, convex or non-convex, this is the optimal shape. And that's uh, what was proven by Hales. Ha, huh, this is what I was trying to say. So, right now, currently, one of the open problems, open problems, I mean, is the problem which is yet to be solved by any of you here. <laughs> Uh, is what's called the honeycomb conjecture. So we talked about partitioning a uh, plane, namely the floor, infinite floor. Now we talk about space, three-dimensional spaces. So fill them with boxes. We fill the godons with boxes, <laughs> right? So cubical boxes and so on. So you fill them with boxes. And ask the same question, which means boxes have uh, the equal volume. Now the area becomes volume here. Equal volume. And the surface area should be <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean, whatever, given surface area, you want to enclose a maximum volume, like the honeycomb thing, yeah, okay? And so naturally, uh, this was actually considered by Lord Kelvin. Uh, the honeycomb, uh, at the time, the hexagonal thing was still not solved, so it was a honeycomb conjecture for him at that time. He said, you know, I mean, <laughs> you try to solve something, if you cannot solve, you put more questions and you can put questions. By the way, questions are very well respected in mathematics. <laughs> so if you put a pose, pose a nice question, you know, you, 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 you can, you know, your name can be there in eternity, <laughs> okay? So, so it's not always solving problems. Yes, sir, yeah? Uh, yeah, what happens if you solve, try to solve this problem using a physical means, like you have a lot of infinite spheres. Yeah. And then increase the pressure so they kind of hide the 
sure, 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 sure. You can do that, you can do that, yeah. But then uh, when the sphere you are right, given a, given a volume, uh, the surface areas. Just put a lot of sphere inside a volume. Oh, sure, sure. And make them all. Sure. The right thing. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, physically, that's what. I, I'll, tell, I'll show you, yeah, exactly. You can try to do it physically, but what happens is that pressure various things, now you get a polyhedron, regular solid. And uh, then you have to really, really kind of, uh, yeah, you'll get a non-regular ones also, right? When you get the non-regular ones or regular ones, you just have to look at the volume, and it's again the same problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, that's precisely how uh, uh, some more conjectures came in. So what you said was inflated sphere, uh, I'll take on that. Uh, uh, you have soap bubbles. Soap bubbles, a single soap bubble is a perfect sphere because it's, a, it's formed of surface tension and uh, it's a perfect sphere, round sphere. And then you see bubbles inside. <laughs> bubbles, if the bubbles are uh, touching each other, like in your washing machine when something is going on, you see the bubbles and the bubbles there. Uh, very, when they touch, naturally, it, it, they, you know, there's a, I mean, when the two bubbles touch, you have actually a disk, a circle, disk, and then when three of them touch, or four of them touch, you get polygons and so on. You see that, yeah. And uh, in fact, that was called, that's something called a double bubble conjecture, and the double bubble conjecture was solved, and Kevin's idea, uh, not Kevin, Kelvin's idea was based on bubble, so bubbles actually, yeah. So people have thought about it, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, this is how the bottom of the, I mean, this is not such a nice picture. This is the best picture. I could get it from the Google. <laughs> and uh, from, well, actually, this is, I got it from the article of Hales, Thomas Hales, 1999. Uh, uh, in, in around 2000, he wrote a nice paper in the Notices of American Math Society. Um, so the other side looks like, this is what I was talking about. You have this pencil, Natraj pencil we used to have, and then, you know, you take a blade and cut out this plane and that plane and three planes meeting. That's how it is, yeah. So Kelvin uh, f uh, you know, thought that, okay, I'll partition the three-dimensional space into boxes with uh, equal volume uh, such that the surface area is optimized, yeah? And uh, so, so he realized that the honeycomb boxes uh, don't really do it. So he, he, he got he called, I don't know, it's called truncated octahedron, I think, yeah, okay? So he saw that these boxes, uh, you know, do it slightly better than the honeycomb boxes, okay? Um, so, somehow he conjectured that that must be the optimal one. So, you can see here it has hexagons and squares, one of the Archimedean solids we saw, truncated octahedron. So, this is the picture, and uh, so he thought uh, this must be it. And it took quite a while. <laughs> so, Kelvin, I think, lived sometime in the 19th century, if I remember right. I think he died early 20th century. Uh, I, I think physicist Sam, maybe. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, so Kelvin, um, so he thought that. Um, and then uh, that was called Kelvin's conjecture. Kelvin thought that the truncated octahedrons will do. But then uh, a physicist called Fallon, Robert Fallon and Vieri. Uh, Fallon is a graduate student of Vieri. In 1994, I didn't mention the year here, 1994, as recently as 1994, the same year that Fermat's last theorem was proven. <laughs> um, so he, uh, they, they looked at these boxes here. Okay. So here it's a combination of boxes. <laughs> Both the, both the boxes have same volume and the same surface area, but the boxes are different, <laughs> okay? One of the boxes is, uh, you can see the pentagons, pentagons, the icos, uh, what is it, dodecahedron, yeah, right? It's an irregular dodecahedron, it's not a regular one. So when you did the bubble thing and do it, when you get this polygon, it may be irreg irregular, that's what happens, you get an irregular one here. And the other box is, you can see six pentagons and a hexagon. <laughs> So I think there's some name given. <laughs> so so the, the boxes are arranged like that. You can fill three-dimensional space with two kinds of boxes now. <laughs> Both have the same surface area and same volume. And uh, they wonder, I mean, this is the counterexample to Kelvin's conjecture. So counterexample to Kelvin's conjecture. And apparently this Fallon um, very structure also appears in some chemical compound in the sense that it's not that these are the ones who discovered it first. It existed before but they realize that they do better than the truncated octahedrons of uh, Lord Kelvin. <laughs> so, so you see, it's a very fascinating world. Already, you know, just boxes and polygons, uh, boxes you read. And actually it inspired, apparently it inspired uh, in China in 2008 Beijing Olympics, they made this aquatic center. And if you see closely, uh, you have these two box, combination, the two boxes here. So people celebrate this, <laughs> okay? <laughs> So it's, it's, it's nice, yeah? 
apparently some ice cubes or whatever they did, yeah. I thought, I thought, you know, that's how mathematics should reach outside also, just to convey some nice problem. But it, as I said, it's an open problem, uh, which is the box or maybe some combination of boxes, but I mean, which is the one which optimizes. So I think uh, after the box, now I'll come back to my tiling. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to, because of the honeycomb, I went on the honeycomb and honeycomb conjecture, and I went to talk about the boxes. So now I come back to tiling usual tiles, yeah? You remember I was talking about what kind of tiling? I was talking about uh, convex uh, polygons, right? And I already finished talking about uh, triangles, and any triangle does, and any quadrilateral does, and I jumped to hexagons. And when I jumped to hexagons, I knew that regular hexagons do it, and are there other hexagons which do, okay? There are definitely other hexagons also, even when you say elongated hexagon also is there, you know? And the thing is that in 1918, Reinhardt, a student of Hilbert, David Hilbert, he showed, he actually could show, he proved this theorem, that if you tile the floor by hexagons, not necessarily regular, but convex hexagons, right now I'll only look at convex, convex hexagons, you understand convex now, you have seen the picture. So convex hexagons, uh, again, you have the side and the angle, so if any hexagon, regular, irregular convex hexagon, has tiled, tessellated the floor, it has to fall into one of the three types, in the sense that the angles, the pose, B, C, D, this relation has to be there. For instance, the regular hexagon satisfies all these, yeah? I mean, a, a, hexag a particular tile can satisfy more than one criterion. The regular hexagon satisfies all the three criterions. And the irregular ones, uh, I mean, if it's irregular ones, it has to be one of the three types. That's a theorem. That's a theorem. If you have an irregular hexagon which tessellated, then you have classified. You have classified into one of the three types. Okay? Yeah, again, the proof is, again, uh, something uh, is understandable by a graduate student. <laughs> it's nice, yeah. Okay, so, so hexagons, basically, we have solved. We meaning, I mean, human... <laughs> have solved that uh, any regular he irregular hexagon, if it tessellates, even if it's irregular, it has to be one of the three types. Okay, not if you have, for instance, if you wanted to tessellate your home with some nice hexagon, okay, unlike triangles and quadrilateral, you couldn't pick whichever your, your favorite was. I mean, your favorite hexagon, if it does not fall into one of the three types, no, sorry, you cannot tessellate your home with that. Yeah, <laughs> you will have to add something else perhaps, okay? So you have to be careful if you want to tile the floor by hexagons, it has to be one of the <laughs> three types, okay? So the mathematicians have answered that, okay. That's nice, I thought, yeah. So Reinhardt, so naturally, after he solved the hexagons, pentagons. So pentagons seem like the most, like, almost like, you know, it's giving problem everywhere <laughs> in some sense. <laughs> but that's the most fascinating thing, yeah. It does give problems, research problems for sure, yeah. Okay. So when you look at pentagons, I called it puzzle, puzzling pentagons, <laughs> basically because, yeah, Reinhardt, since he proved the uh, uh, hexagon stuff, so he also thought, okay, pentagons, uh, he could show that if it is some of the types, let's say five types, exactly the same way, in the sense that you put the side and angle specifications, okay? If you have a pentagon with this, one of the five uh, which he had, uh, you know, classified, one of the five specifications, then you can tessellate. Okay, but what he couldn't prove or what he left was are they more than five or are they only five? Okay, like unlike in hexagon, you could prove that if anything happens, it has to be only three. <laughs> but now he showed five. Well, it was not a theorem, but at least he showed five. Okay, and for some reasons, looks like for many years, maybe it's a tiling or whatever, it was not uh, fashion, I think. Only some 50 years later, uh, another geometer from Germany, Kirschner, he found three more types, <laughs> in the sense that he found three more types of pentagons with three different specifications, three different ones, different from the five which uh, Reinhardt had uh, found. So you, now you had eight types. Eight different types of irregular pentagons. Convex, all the time it's convex. Now I am in the convex world, okay? All convex polygons, uh, so he found eight of them. And then, Somebody apparently announced a proof <laughs> that, oh, these are the only eight types. And, uh, and then somebody also found a f 
uh, somebody else found a fallacy in the proof. I mean, there was, a difficult, uh, there was something wrong in the proof. So it was not only eight. And Martin Gardner, one of the delightful <laughs> writers uh, uh, for popular this thing, mathematics, uh, I think we need to find such Martin Gardners also in India for sure. <laughs> I think ICTS's initiative uh, <laughs> definitely should help uh, with the curiosity. So it's not just about you know, talking and so on. I think it's very important. So he wrote, <laughs> I'll tell you the far-reaching consequence of writing these things. Uh, as I said in my talk, I really am footloose. I really am <laughs> keeping myself lots and lots of things to say in between. I'm, I'm kind of greedy. So Martin Gardner wrote in Scientific American, a popular magazine, and when he wrote, it really turned very interesting turn of events, which you will see. <laughs> Reading uh, his article, a computer scientist, <laughs> Richard James in the US, he found a ninth type of <laughs> pentagon. <laughs> okay, different specification, the eight earlier ones. Okay, <laughs> ninth type he found. Fine, the story is getting thick. <laughs> This is a major contribution from somebody called Marjorie Rice. She, the reason why I said far-reaching consequences is that she saw her son reading Scientific American. <laughs> she was fascinated by this Pentagon problem, or whatever, Martin Gardner's article. It's not only about the problem, the delightful way he wrote. So she read this. And she also read, uh, because it reported that you know, James um, uh, had uh, found uh, uh, a ninth type of polygon. So this, this is, by the way, this is from a poster. <laughs> this is from a poster uh, which was a, a, of a conference in honor of Marjorie Rice, okay? So she, uh, <laughs> let's, let me just read, I think, it's very fascinating. After reading about the discovery of James's pentagon, ninth type of pentagon, Marjorie Rice, a San Diego housewife, <laughs> A mother of five with no mathematical training, except high school mathematical training. This is what I kept saying, elementary but not simple, in the sense that, you know, elementary, the methods are elementary, which, you know, it doesn't involve sophisticated ones. But the proof may involve something. But anyway, I mean, in her case, she was curious to see if she could find more. And lo and behold, because she came up with her own notation, <laughs> because she had to keep track of whatever she found, various nine types, no, uh, because she developed her own notation. That's the beauty about this uh, whole thing. Uh, describe angles in a pentagon, she was able to see things that professional mathematicians had overlooked. In 1976, a year after James found, she, she found another first discovery of a new tiling pentagon. <laughs> that was the tenth type. And since she had kind of so systematically done, she found three more. So she f totally found four more, 10, 11, and 13. Just a year later. So, so that's, a, that's one of the things I wanted to say. It's very fascinating. <laughs> And that's how you involve uh, you know, larger public, uh, everyone into the fold. It's curiosity. <laughs> you ask out of curiosity and you find something. It's nice. I mean, it's nice to find more pentagons, uh, types, which can tile your floor. <laughs> okay? So she found four more. So nine plus four became 13. And uh, some 10 years later, a German graduate student, he was a PhD student, he found a 14th type. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> so it, it, it's it's really fun. No, I mean it's really nice. No, very interesting, right? I mean, I, it, there's no sophisticated thing involved here. Sophisticated in the sense of you know <laughs> mathematics that we are using, <laughs> but it's just about sides, edge lengths, and angles. I think this is a fascinating story. And I think, yeah, breaking news, of course, television says breaking news, it happens recently, but I think for mathematicians, something which happened about a year and a half ago is a breaking news, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> because we still talk about twin prime conjecture, which is a breaking news, which was done in 2013. <laughs> uh, it's natural, it's, it's exciting to be living in a time when some new discoveries are found. So it's a breaking news as far as mathematicians are concerned. A year and a half ago, Naturally, the, it's not that people are not looking at it. People have been looking at it. It has taken 30 years to find a 15th type now. <laughs> so you are finding more and more. 15th type was found by three computer scientists. Uh, but they, of course, used computers here. And exhaustively searched through a large but a finite set of possibilities. You remember I mentioned in the Archimedean tiling and so on, I said there is some equation. The equation gives you some finitely many possibilities. And out of that, you keep trying, trying each of them. Sometimes you may succeed and sometimes you may not, right? I mean, as I mentioned. So similar here also. You have a certain, certain equation that you form out of some very similar to the easy arithmetic that I mentioned, which 
tells you, you look at some finitely many possibilities. I mean, it doesn't really mean that there are only finitely many possibilities also. There could be infinitely many. But that particular way of looking at it, like Marjorie Rice notation got her four, some other this thing, uh, if at all it's possible with that kind of notation, finitely many possibilities, they really exhaustively search through using computers and found one. <laughs> okay, so that's the 15th type. We'll come to it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, one doesn't know yet. It's an open problem. If you find a 16th one, you will make a big news, honestly. Yeah. Honestly. It, you said it is a finite set in the... Sorry. Ah, finite set. That's what I said. Yeah, finite set in the kind of uh, search that they were making. <laughs> I mean, that equation would give some kind of pos pentagon possibilities, but it may not give you all pentagon possibilities. <laughs> okay? Finite in, that se in the sense of that particular possibility that he was looking at, yeah. Here, yeah, they were looking at, yeah. Yeah, as I said, you know, I mean, you can have your own criteria. Uh, just see, I mean, okay, I want to do this, this angle, and so on. The fascinating thing with this is, all the angles are different, and all the side lengths are different, and one of the side lengths even has an irrational number. <laughs> so that makes it very fascinating. The question is, Wow, this is an irrational number and so on, and we know that tons and tons of ir irrational numbers. <laughs> so does it really mean uh, your own question, uh, whether it's only finite 15 types or there is a 16 type or irrational thing, I don't know, are there infinitely many? It's, uh, everything, is, the question is wide open for anyone here. <laughs> like Marjorie Rice, you may actually develop your own notations, surely. It's, 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 no, it's, as I said, the problem is elementary, uh, but I mean, it's, it's anybody's game, yeah. By the way, I personally have not worked in any of the tiling here. That's not my this thing, but I'm interested in geometry. I thought for a larger audience, we'll talk about something which, which can, one can get across, okay. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah. So this is a nice problem. So I have given you two problems. I'm sure both the problems you understood. First problem was the honeycomb conjecture. Boxes, making boxes. <laughs> and this is the other one, okay. And um, uh, one of the mathematicians, Frank Morgan, who wrote in notices, says that he thinks that, well, Kelvin, Kelvin's, uh, whatever, that uh, honeycomb conjecture might take another 100 years to solve, but I'm sure one of you can disprove, <laughs> not, not, not have to wait 100 years. <laughs> By the way, when I'm saying this, I, I seem to be saying it as a joke and this thing. No, I mean, I'm sure <laughs> there may be smart people around, definitely. Okay, so this is the 15th type, and I'll just list all the current status. These are the 15 <laughs> different types. Okay, <laughs> yeah. So far, so far. This is the story so far. So you can add to the list. So pentagons, irregular convex pentagons, I have given you the story so far. Okay? And this is the specifications. And here when I say, when the color code, I mean these uh, green here means that these two sides are the same length. For instance, these three sides are the same length. In this one, all the side lengths are different. <laughs> so, and so on. So it's e easy to see whatever, yeah, uh, the specification and the 15 specification that was here, yeah. Okay? Okay. So I thought, having talked about tiles, by the way, again, uh, it's not an easy, yeah, go ahead, yeah. Type, yeah. One pentagon or a class of pentagons? One pentagon, just one pentagon. By the way, yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole problem so far I have talked about, Archimedean tiling had involved two kind of different kind of thing, but so far in the convex polygon question I asked, only one type, it's called monotiling, yeah. I'm only talking about monotiling, yeah. Yeah. This one, yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, next, oh, you mean for uh, uh, afterwards or? Yeah. Yeah. No. No. So uh, the sixth one, for example, uh, sixth had uh, sixth, sixth type. Yeah, yeah sixth one here, yeah. correct. Right? Uh, has three equal sides. Yeah. And two equal sides. Yeah. And but you could, you could make the sides. Uh, I mean, there could be multiple hexagons of the same type with different side lengths. Multiple. Here, the lengths are fixed. Yeah. Here, the lengths are fixed. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Here, the lengths are fixed. Absolutely. They can't, I, I they, you, they can't be changed. They can't be changed. No, they can't be changed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I'll just show the picture again. This picture, uh, just to kind of say what happened. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can't change them at all. Yeah. 
There's 90 here, the 90 figures here. Yeah, that's about it. But it's a monotile in the sense that only one tile. So I, you can actually make uh, one particular tile with this specification. You can make lots and lots of copies, and then you kind of test later around. Yeah. 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 That, that, that was a, that's a faulty proof, yeah. No, no, so, someone proved it, but the proof was faulty. Yeah. Oh, let me just keep saying, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 that's what, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, some, some stuff is, was uh, definitely wrong, and, and uh, conclusively it was proven by actually exhibiting a new type, right? So naturally the proof has to be wrong, yeah. That's right, yeah. It's called a counterexample, yeah. Just as in the honeycomb conjecture, for the Kelvin's, Kelvin's conjecture, uh, um, the Fallon VRA that I mentioned found a counterexample to the truncated octahedron, right? So very similar, you find a counterexample, yeah. Yeah, the proof was definitely wrong, yeah. And that was what was pointed out in Martin Gardner's article, the Scientific American article. So, yeah, but only thing is, I mean, yeah, of course, you have to arrange it. You also have to say one tile, but you have to arrange it in this way. For instance, when you see here, it's basically a certain pattern. If you see these lines here and so on, uh, you have to put it in that, and you, that kind of thing repeats, yeah. Okay? Yeah, so far, uh, one question which comes to our mind is that when I'm talking about tiling and so on, uh, one particular tiling and so on, I am somehow assuming, in some sense, that you understand what tiling is, in the sense that a certain pattern is there, and the pattern has to repeat, right? I just, just as you tile, I take this tile, and maybe I just say, I'll do this side, and you do that side, and so on. You go, what is in the x-coordinate direction, y-coordinate direction kind of thing. And that's what tiling is. That's called a regular tiling. Regular or periodic tiling. Periodic means they appear in very regular fashion. Okay, that's called a periodic tiling. Okay? And whatever we are talking about is periodic tiling, okay? In the sense that, I mean, I am here, you are there, locally when we see here, it's exactly the same picture, <laughs> okay? I mean, in, in such a small neighborhood. Yeah, okay, so I went through this. Huh, I want to go to a non-Euclidean detour. Uh, this is something slightly beyond, but still you just assume, and I'll assume in the sense that we talked about flat plane, and we talked about uh, sphere, round sphere, when you take a usual ball, it's so nice that it's one color or something. Any point looks like any other point. So in a sense, this is, there's something nice about it. It's called a constant positive curvature. And there is something called negative curvature, which Amit mentioned. So uh, since it's my fascination, um, a saddle, for instance, uh, is a typical example of, because you know, one part curves like that, other part curves like that. Like on a camel's back when you sit, it's because of negative curvature you can sit stably. <laughs> okay? If it was just a ball like a sphere, I'm sure you would fall off very easily. <laughs> right? Uh, right? So it's the saddle which makes it very stable, yeah? That's negative curvature, yeah? And uh, uh, so, yeah, so I thought I'll just talk about some non-Euclidean. Non-Euclidean in the sense that Remember, I mentioned something about what is called a Euclid's parallel postulate. I'll just take maybe another 10 minutes. Uh, Euclid's parallel postulate. Um, so, you know, that was a problem which was there for 1,000 years. I wondered whether it, the, the whatever assumption was necessary or not. It took about 2,000 years to come up with another kind of geometry, possible geometry. Uh, to quickly give you an idea, um, uh, when you look at the, the flat plane, I have always been talking about a triangle and talking about the sum of the interior angles of a triangle. That is 180. But on a sphere, when you take the sphere, the surface of the Earth, you can have triangles in the sense that you have to have analogs of what are called straight lines here, because triangles are formed out of straight lines. On the sphere, you need some kind of special curves which kind of replaces, uh, you know, straight lines. They are called geodesics. And later on in a show, slide, I will show what a geodesic is. When you look at the geodesic triangle, <laughs> there on the sphere, you will have the sum of the three angles is bigger than 180, as you know, okay? It's bigger than 180. So now, you can ask again a curiosity, a question. <laughs> can I find a geometry where I have notion of these straight lines, geodesic triangle, where the sum of the angles is less than 180? And non-Euclidean geometry, which was discovered by Lobachevsky and Bolia and Gauss, um, uh, so that is a, you know, one which has that kind of thing. And here, this particular geometry gives you lots and lots of possibilities, infinitely many possibilities of lovely, lovely tiling. 
You remember, when we talked about regular polygons, only finitely many of them. Archimedean tiling, only finitely many of them. Here, in non-Euclidean geometry, you can actually tile with a regular pentagon, but regular pentagon in the non-Euclidean, uh, what's called the hyperbolic geometry. So this is one of those regular. I mean, here, these two look very different, but in non-Euclidean geometry, they're the same. You can, you, know, you can isometrically map this to that by a certain isometry. So you can have, when you go to non-Euclidean geometry, you can actually tessellate or tile by non-Euclidean hyperbolic uh, pentagons. <laughs> and not only pentagons, you can do octagons. This is an octagon here. Octagons, 12 guns, any even-sided. Even if you say something like 2,000 million or whatever even-sided, you can still tessellate by that kind of a thing. Yeah, it's possible. <laughs> because there is so much, uh, that's, the, that's the beauty of this geometry. Because you can have, Unlike Euclidean geometry, given, a, given a, a straight line and a point not on it, you can draw only one in Euclidean geometry, one, only one line which is parallel. Here, you can draw infinitely many lines, <laughs> which parallel in the sense that they do not meet in extended both sides. And that gives you beautifully infinitely many possibilities. And I thought, I'll, you know, I have to mention something which I like a lot, namely negative curvature geometry. And I have, I have mentioned this with a specific reason. Next slide, I'll, I think I'll <laughs> say a little bit about this, okay? And what I'm trying to say here is, when you talk about a cycle tube, inflated cycle tube, okay? So we have this tessellation by squares, and they're all the same. And you know, when I move from here to here, here to here, move them at regular intervals, what's called a rigid motion of the Euclidean plane. And so in a sense, the geometry, uh, I mentioned the ball, the sphere, or the soap bubble, <laughs> one single solitary soap bubble, the round sphere. That's a, uh, this thing for uh, positive curvature. And uh, the geometry for, the, for this inflated cycle tube, uh, the natch more Johnson geometry is what is called the geometry of zero curvature. It's called a flat torus. And uh, you, can, you can get that by a kind of a typical mathematical identification. Uh, here, I'll just appeal to your imagination. Yeah? Identification in the sense that identify by isometries. So in a sense, typically in classes, let's say, uh, when you want to make a torus, uh, let's say, how does one make a cycle tube, inflated cycle tube? You have a sheet of rubber, and then you, uh, you, know, you identify the two glue, and then you get a nice tube, and then the tubes, you put it here together, I mean, the circles, right? That's how you do it. That's how you get this, and that's, that's a natural description. So similarly, for uh, what is called a double torus, these days you would see double torus, I'm sure, in Wonderland, such amusement parks, right? There are three double hole, two holes, <laughs> yeah, torus. <laughs> and there are several holes, uh, three holes and four holes. By the way, this is mathematically understood that all uh, surfaces with several holes, uh, whatever, uh, you know, um, the only, only these are them. It's a nice classification theorem which was uh, 100, you know, 100 years ago. Um, so anyway, so coming back to this, so when you take a cycle tube, you cut it along this, you get a tube, a open tube, and then you cut along uh, one of the, uh, this thing, the cylinder, you get the square. So similarly, if you cut along these kind of curves, you get an octagon, and here you get a 12 gun. And if you had one with four holes, you get a, a 16 gun, five holes, 20 gun, it's a multiple of four, that's how it goes. The reason why I'm saying is that because, just as you can do this in Euclidean geometry, identification, natural geometry on that, natural geometry for surfaces with more number of holes is what is called hyperbolic geometry, geometry of negative curvature, okay? I'll just quickly, I mean, I'll not, uh, and I thought again, I mean, I said M.C. Escher, he tried to describe the excitement of mathematics by his pictures, and this is one of his art. And uh, I'll now come back to crystals. You remember crystals? I mentioned crystals, you look at the diffraction pattern, diffraction pattern, you look at the, there's some kind of a tiling, it goes with tiling. So this Dan Sheckman in 1982, uh, by the way, he was here, he was in India last year at the Indian Science Congress in Mysore. Um, he came across a certain crystal uh, whose, uh, I'll do quickly, um, whose diffraction pattern <laughs> showed something which was not quite <laughs> the kind of tiling that we have seen so far. Okay, we haven't seen so far, in the sense that, I mean, uh, the people had seen, but we haven't seen in this lecture so far, okay? And that tiling uh, was there, and it was realized that it, it was modeled on a certain tiling called Penrose's tiling. Um, I, uh, yeah, this is uh, sometime in 1975 or so, Roger Penrose, a phys British physicist, um, he 
talked about a tiling, and I'll just mention this tiling here. So here, it, now it's not a monotiling, it's a combination of two tiles, and what he called as thick diamonds and thin diamonds, <laughs> okay? Um, so the, the green ones are the thin diamonds, and the blue ones are the thick diamonds. You can put a combination and you get this, okay? You can fill up the space, okay? And here, it's not periodic in the sense of, you know, Euclidean this motion and so on, because, you know, they're kind of, they're somewhere, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I'm here and you are somewhere there, our neighborhoods could look very different, yeah. Uh, so, but it does tessellate. Uh, and this tessellation, of course, it, then say, what is so, uh, you know, profound about this? Because you start with two building blocks only, namely thick diamonds and thin diamonds, and then you tessellate, <laughs> okay? It's not a periodic tiling, but it has a, what is called a radial symmetry around this, uh, this point, one fixed point, five-fold symmetry it has, yeah. But it's not a periodic tiling. And uh, so, and the thing is that, yeah, I just mentioned thick diamonds and the areas, uh, the ratio of the areas uh, of the uh, thick diamond, uh, the blue by green, is what is called the golden ratio, you know, the square root of five plus one by two, okay? And he used that to say this. And now I come back to something, uh, this is Roger Penrose, I thought I'd show, and to celebrate um, uh, this thing, there's a tile and he's standing on his Roger Penrose tiling. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it must be a remarkable thing uh, to stand on your own tiles. <laughs> and the joke is that, there's a joke, I mean, um, in Oxford um, Mathematics Institute building, in front of that also they have made this Penrose tiling, and Penrose actually even now uh, works there in Oxford. <laughs> and I was told that uh, apparently one evening Penrose was there looking at tiling like this, very pensive. And people were wondering whether he's still checking, verifying whether he's right or wrong. <laughs> but of course it's right. <laughs> but I'm sure he must have been really, really fascinated. Perhaps he was looking at another theorem, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is Penrose. And, um, and you remember, uh, in my footloose story, I left some thread somewhere. Namely, I left the effort of Kepler to talk about tiling with a combination of pentagons and a decagon. He couldn't do it, but he had some nice picture, lovely looking picture, and he left it there, and because it looked lovely, he wrote the picture in his book. But that inspired <laughs> Penrose. Penrose says that looking at that picture inspired him to kind of come up with this tiling. And again, there was a pentagon there, and somehow this pentagon somehow seems like a, <laughs> a recurring theme. And he came across with this. The reason I am showing this picture is because the blue and this gray, these ones are the Penrose's thick and thin diamonds. Whereas this, this thing is a superimposed. I put this superimposed, not me, I mean, I found a picture, thankfully. <laughs> um, this is the effort uh, which uh, you can see the stars here of Kepler. So if you, you know, on Kepler's picture, you kind of see superimposed neatly and you can get this. That's how, uh, that inspired basically him, yeah. I mean, of course, he had to do a lot of hard work for sure. <laughs> but, you know, uh, a problem which cannot be solved, it's, it's nice, yeah. And I'll just quickly uh, mention this. So I just thought I'll, I brought this thing also, just to be pentagons. Um, uh, I'm sure many people cannot see, but still, yeah. So there is a regular pentagon. The thing with regular pentagon is that, which you do in Rangoli and so on, you have a regular pentagon. And then you, you know, extend these sides and you get a bigger regular pentagon. And then you extend these sides, you get something like that. These regular pentagons, the bigger one to the smaller one, the area, uh, the, the ratio of the area is again a golden uh, ratio. The pentagon has that property, <laughs> okay, that comes up with this. And actually, one talks about usually nature, one sees such a thing. And I thought I'll show this, <laughs> namely that uh, there's a regular pentagon here. And these sides, let's say, when you do this, so you get this, then the bigger regular pentagon. Somewhat like similar to the, exactly similar to the picture that I showed earlier. And I'm sure people can recognize this flower. This is usually think, thought of as a weed and people raise it down. <laughs> it's in Sanskrit, it's called arka. In Kannada, we call it ekka, ekka dhuvu. And I thought I'll quote here uh, Dirac, P.A.M. Dirac, the beauty of mathematics. It's quite clear that beauty does depend on one's culture and upbringing for certain kinds of beauty, pictures, literature, poetry, and so on. But mathematical beauty is of a rather different kind and transcends these personal factors. It is the same in all countries at, at, at all periods of time. And I thought, I'll, again, the same Arka flower, another variety. It has, again, the same pentagons here and the regular pentagon and so on. <laughs> it's the natural, nature's regular pentagons. And again, I quote Hardy here, I believe 
this is, I think, very, it, this is a really humble message for mathematicians, researchers, in the sense that this is, this is what keeps going. That the mathematical reality lies outside us, and that our function is to discover or observe it, and that the theorems which we prove and which we describe grand eloquently as our creations are simply the notes of our observations. <laughs> I mean, that's one aspect. I mean, I think uh, it's very nice, especially because I thought I'll just show some Rangoli patterns, and I see some kind of polygons here. I'm sure if somebody can come up with a nice uh, 16th pentagon Rangoli, it would be very nice, yeah. <laughs> I invite <laughs> everyone <laughs> and the regular patterns, I thought, I mean, and also I just thought, I said, so I ju I'm just showing some pictures, just now I'm just showing some pictures in the nature, so I talked about geodesics on the sphere of, on the surface of the Earth, and look at this. <laughs> These are the geodesics. And if you want to cut it into half, you basically slice along this, and it goes to the center, assuming that the whole thing is a perfect sphere. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, but I thought it's nice. I mean, what we humans think, it's sort of sometimes there. I mean, just to kind of, uh, you know, fortify what Hardy said. That's one take on mathematics research. And actually, this is something funny. Uh, you know, the Arka flower I saw here in Bangalore, uh, I saw those two pictures that I showed. And in Delhi and Jaipur, when I went recently, I found the same plant. I just went to see, because I always love seeing it. And I went close and saw. Uh, look, it, it seems to have modified here. I don't know if a biologist should tell me sort of if, if I take the same seed here and plant it there, the flower gets modified slightly in the sense of, you know, the, because of the temperature difference. I do not know really. I just thought I'll show you some, list. for instance, I just want to just share some nature geometry, like, you know, so beautiful lines, right, right, right. This is, uh, we call, in Kannada we call Harale, Eranda, Heranda in um, Sanskrit, <laughs> castor, castor plant, and it's one of my favorite ones. The reason I am showing this is because poor creatures are not <laughs> attended to by anyone, <laughs> any building, people, first thing, they just remove this, <laughs> and I just thought it's, they're so beautiful, and why we remove it? And I thought I'll end my talk with this nice slide. Um, which is a kind of thing that, you know, I mean, you keep destroying nature and you may not have anything to observe and prove theorems. So this is a Chinese saying, saying that there once lived a man who learned how to slay dragons and gave all he possessed to mastering the art. After three years, he was fully prepared, but alas, he found no opportunity to practice his skills. And then a uh, fields medalist called René Thom says, as a result, he began to teach how to slay dragons. So I'm sure if we destroy all our nature, I'm sure we will only be talking about it. And I think we should look at nature and learn. That's my talk. Thank you. Okay, uh, I guess uh, thanks a lot, Arvinda, for this absolutely exciting talk. Uh, Questions, uh, we will have, so uh, a few ground rules. Uh, please wait for somebody to come with a mic to you. I will try to keep track of who has raised hands, and I will go in the order in which the hands were raised. If I miss, sorry, I can't keep track of so many people. Uh, and there are people upstairs, so I, uh, I guess uh, Vijay, my colleague, he will go upstairs and brings the question that they write down on pieces of paper, and I will interspace the questions here with the questions over there. Yeah, so those are, uh, so I guess let's start yeah. with, uh, yeah. I saw somebody there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, actually, sorry, sorry. Yeah. I, so, I, had a, I had a question before huh. you start your questions. Okay, sure. <laughs> uh, not to you. Not to me. To, okay. To all of these people. Uh, how many of you have been to at least one copy with Curiosity Talk before? Can you raise your hands, please? Wow, great. That's super. Oh, okay. that's super. I think ICTS is doing great okay, job. Okay, then. <laughs> Excellent. So I would say about 80 to 90 percent. Oh, yeah. beautiful. Just beautiful. my guess. That's okay, nice. fine. Very great. nice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, questions now. Questions. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for the wonderful talk, sir. And uh, you told about the 15 type of pentagons to tile the plane, right? So is there any limit to the perimeter of the one of those uh, 15 types? Is there any limit or is there any constraint? No, 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 nothing like perimeter limit. I mean, you can just find any pentagon. Uh, you don't have limit, but it's just that, I mean, you, it has to be a five-sided polygon, that's all, yeah. So that means the basic, basic block of tessellating, uh, mm. the repeating pattern can be as big or as small? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. It can be big, no problem, yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Because thankfully, Euclidean similarity transformation is there. If you find a big one, then you can find uh, same angle and site specification, a proportional one, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Oh, great. Yes. Um, I'm in sixth grade. I don't know. I'm still learning math. Mm -hmm. So, I didn't exactly understand the formula you gave in the beginning. Oh, you, want, you, you did not understand it. Oh, sure. I can go back. Uh, fine. I'll go back to that slide. I think there's a way to do it, right? Yeah. 
Does it go like that? There's somewhere it goes. Oh, I'm so sorry. I did some nonsense. Okay. Oh, what? No, there's some. Okay, I'll go back. I'll go back. Yeah, I think I'll just go back like. No, sorry. So something happened. I know how to do it. I think this is here. Somewhere you can do something. No. No. I think yeah. Okay. I think laptops are different. Yeah. Okay, I can do it with this. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Ah, it, I think I got it, yeah. Board is also there. I got it. Oh, yeah. Oh, board is also there. I can use the board. Thank you. Yeah. I'll anyway, since you, yeah. Uh, since you, everyone, yeah. Okay. So is this, it, the, the blue, is the blue line one? is the equation that I wrote. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sure. I just simplified this. Um, the interior angle is of, e, of a polygon with k sides is pi minus 2 pi by k. Do you know that? In terms of degrees, okay, you will learn it. Yeah, in terms of degrees, I think it is n n n divided by n minus two but times so three hundred sixty. How many people know it, by the way? Well, maybe less than about half of them. So don't. n minus two times one eighty. Exactly, n minus two times one eighty. Perfect. Yeah. Of the polygon with the answer, perfectly. That's right. <laughs> n minus two times hundred and eighty. I am writing it in a slightly different language. Uh, 180 is pi, 2 pi is 360, it's the same thing. What I wrote is exactly the same thing. Okay, so instead of using pi, you can do exactly n minus 2 times 80 and uh, you can form a similar equation. And uh, then, then in that case, 180 are some factor, common factor, you take it out, you will actually get this equation. I can guarantee. How do you get 180 minus 360 divided by the number of sides? 180? You said pi is 180. Ah, uh, the, see, the thing is that it's a different kind of measurement. Uh, that's why I said I was saying, talking about in 12th standard, you come across what is called radians. Um, that's a different measure. Just as you have centimeters and inches, a length, right? You measure in centimeters, you measure in inches, and you measure, uh, measure perhaps in something else. <laughs> um, so similarly, angle, uh, what we normally study is very good. It's, it's we study what is called degrees. Degrees is like centimeters. Uh -huh. Radians. Ah, radian, yeah. Yeah, radian is another measure, like an inch, and there's a conversion between centimeters and inches, right? You know that, no? So, like, uh, I think 2.4 uh, uh, centimeters is an inch. It's can I interrupt for a second? Sure, sure. So, uh, Maybe, can we, yeah. can we come back to these questions exactly. after sure. the talk? Sure. Uh, yeah, but it's a different is, measure. So, uh, sure. right after the questions, uh, there's a big blackboard here. Oh, it yeah. will be, the easiest thing would be yeah. I, to explain it on sure. the blackboard, uh, on the blackboard. Once, uh, right, right. once we finish uh, these questions. questions. Uh, Thank you very much for this very fascinating excursion. Thank you. You are <laughs> like a pied piper. All the students could have followed you into the mathematics land. Thank very you. stimulating <laughs> as well. Thank you, sir. But I want to add, because of time limitation, you may not have drawn attention to that, that the Arab contribution, yeah. tessellations, is very yeah. important. Yeah, exactly. Alhambra. Yeah, Alhambra. Asher was actually inspired to do all his work yeah. by looking at those tessellations. Correct. That's right. Without any knowledge of geometry or working out those things, they found all the two-dimensional tilings, the 17 That's tessellations. Right. Alhambra so has this particular… It's a very important uh, absolutely. position. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. And yeah. same thing with Iran, yeah. the Isafagan, the, uh, the mosques and so on. Hmm. The most beautiful paintings are there. Yes, yes. I right. want to make only two more ah. remarks. One is amateur mathematicians have done fantastic work. Mm -hmm. Amman tilings mm -hmm. are as important as those of Penrose tilings. Correct. Absolutely. Amman was a postmaster. Yeah. I mean, just by intuitive ways, he came up with those tilings. And I feel the critical step that even though these tilings appear aperiodic, they can still give rise to diffraction patterns. Correct. Was a step taken by Professor Alan Mackay. That's correct. Yeah. From London. Uh -huh. He looked at it and actually drew the pattern mm -hmm. and had a laser diffraction pattern on mm -hmm. that and showed it. But the first time it was realized that even though there is no strict periodicity, yeah. you can still have diffraction pattern. Correct, correct. That gave rise to the explanation for Professor Sh Dan Shekman's Sh yeah, work. Dan so Thank you very much for a wonderful pleasure, deal. Pleasure, pleasure. Actually, here I just will say something. Uh, the golden ratio was one, was one of the things used. The golden ratio is one of the numbers of a kind of a infinitely kind of numbers where it has an Indian contribution. It's called piso Vijayaragavan numbers. There's something called piso Vijayaragavan numbers. And golden ratio is one of the piso Vijayaragavan numbers. Just as using golden ratio, you can theorize, you, you have a quasi-crystal. To each piso Vijayaragavan number, 
theoretically you can associate a quasi crystal so you can have infinitely many kind of such uh, aperiodic quasi crystals that's right yeah, i mean I, I, i'm told it's theoretically possible but i don't know yeah so a question I'm from above is there are there different types of concave pentagons huh. which can be tiled and arranged in the in the in the symmetric pattern i would imagine so concave pentagons yes you can have uh, are, are there known examples i Let think that's not difficult to create um, well i mean i haven't i haven't done it myself once so but i but but they're easy to create i'm sure whoever asked the question can definitely uh, concave pentagon you can do uh, I, I, at least one type you can definitely do that yeah perfectly fine it's possible yeah okay so one more question from above uh, i have heard of polytopes in more than three dimensions mm -hmm. do any of them tessellate polytopes in higher dimensions yes people to talk about yeah definitely tessellations for instance the standard cube standard the cube thing whatever you can take uh, that that's a polytope i suppose right i mean i don't know yeah uh, actually yeah. Uh, the and question uh, was in more than yeah, in more than three dimensions yeah, yeah, sure. uh, yeah. so there there no yeah exactly yeah. Yeah. i like the fact that you say question from above <laughs> i love it <laughs> <laughs> hello sir hello sir i have doubt uh, i don't have doubt about this uh, tessellation right now i have from the basic geometry sir Mm -hmm. so can i ask that doubt sure sure so sure. it's uh, about uh, the definition of a line we hmm. normally use yes. uh, line is a breadth uh, breadth less length huh. but uh, while you form a plane plane surface then you say that uh, you continuously uh, i mean uh, take closely pack this lines will hmm. make a plane mm -hmm. uh, form a plane mm -hmm. so then the breadth comes into picture and mm. if you uh, see if, uh, uh, in physics that uh, at least one atom should be there uh, continuous path of one line if we have to get one line we have to get a uh, you know uh, continuous what? dots should what? be what? there the Correct. dot will obviously will have radius yes. and diameter and yes. it is having yes so how uh, uh, dot what is dot has diameters is what you said yeah aha uh -huh. so well, dot that, if you see in a microscope yeah, you will get dot it's so, so, dot so, so dot maybe uh, can i can i i yeah. think yeah. i Yeah. I think I understood the question but huh. let me try. Yeah. Uh, so so, I think so, so I, yeah. I, ahead, yeah. so th this is uh, the mathematical concept of a line or a dot yeah. is yeah. a idealization yeah. of the physical exactly yeah that's, dot that's which what, yeah. of course has a dimension. Yeah. But a uh, but a mathematical concept is without uh, the dot without does not have any dimension. Correct. And uh, yeah so I think that that's that's so the plane uh, yeah. is and also the same <laughs> thing with plane <laughs> and okay. yeah. lines yeah. and yeah. so on and so forth yeah. yeah? Okay. Yeah. That's thanks amit yeah yeah uh, yes the uh, archimedean uh, tiling mm -hmm. you want to go to the picture huh? eight of them right huh eight right um eight of them apart from the three regular uh, yeah. ones yeah yeah totally 11 right yeah so you will you get more if you use a uh, use different Uh, different regular polygons, uh, uh, different sizes of the same regular polygon. Different sizes of the same regular polygon. Uh, For example, uh, squares with size two, uh, uh, with squares with size uh, with. Uh, oh yeah, it, side one. I, I'm sure you can do that. No, for instance, I think yeah. I mean, for, for instance, big square, you fill it up with some small squares like that, right? Yeah. Or. Yeah. Or larger triangles. Yeah. Small triangles. Sure, sure. Small triangles. For instance, hexagon. Squares. Hexagon itself, you can put six triangles and make it into a hexagon. Yeah, so, I think so, you can so, do so that. So I think no? maybe the question is, if you take huh. tiles with irregular, I mean, different different sizes different and shapes. Different sizes, yeah, shapes, yeah. And then then what yeah, happens? Yeah, yeah. You can do it as long as you match the criteria and the angle when you take these ones. For instance, when you work with squares, different shapes, this thing, so it's the angle that has to match. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. solids archimedean solids also i suppose it should work yeah yeah the same logic yeah uh, hello sir uh, sir uh, in the 15th type of pentagon you showed uh, one of the sides was irrational how to realize that in the physical world like can we make actually a tiling using that because oh, yeah yeah that that was an example exactly yeah 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 so but then uh, oh. a rational number is a non in, non ending decimal right i mean it cannot oh, be exact I, i'll so. give an example uh, for instance you know root 2 square root 2 is an irrational you know how to uh, create a length of root you, you, you know how to write how to write down a length of a square root of 2 right what you do is you just take uh, 
right angle triangle of side one and this is root two, right? That's how you can write root two length. I mean, that's physically realized, right? So similarly, you realize that too, yeah. It's re realizable, yeah. See, that's what happens sort of if you go only theoretically kind of decimal and so on, <laughs> but it's realizable. In fact, that's how the ancient people realized that existence of such numbers like irrational numbers, yeah. <laughs> they physically saw it, yeah. So, yes. uh, I just wanted to ask that, uh, as you said, in a spherical, uh, in a, on a spherical plane, uh, uh, the, uh, the shapes are different. So, is there any theory of converting, uh, theorem of converting huh. the normal shapes to those shapes? Normal shapes meaning normal in the plane, planar the shapes to the sphere? Lines planar to, to uh, the sphere? Oh, yeah. yeah, you can do something. There's something called a nice stereographic projection. I'll use this, this thing. I mean, converting in the sense that, I mean, I, I can tell you how to do it. So, suppose I take a plane like that. And I take, let's say, a sphere. Not too bad, I think. It's not, right? <laughs> and equator here. So, you take this north pole. And what you do is, from so north pole, you just flash a torch light. And it just comes here and meets here. So, that, so, the points on the sphere, you can project it onto the plane. And so, whatever you have on the sphere gets projected to the plane. And actually, by the way, there are lovely lampshades using that concept. <laughs> I had some nice pictures, but anyway, it's too... Yeah. You can do that, yes. Okay, uh, so another question from, from above. above. <laughs> uh, can, can, a, can a Mobius loop be tiled in a three-dimensional pattern? <laughs> well, <laughs> I have to think. <laughs> yeah, as I mentioned... I uh, questions are very interesting, but not all questions can be immediately answered. I may have to think for that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And, and there is a question about crystal. I'm not quite sure I understand, huh. so I will I will leave it. Uh, okay. So whoever asked the question about crystal, please ask uh, Arvinda during the uh, <laughs> during the coffee. There was a question over here. Huh. Mohan had some question, I think. Yeah. Um, sir, this is an elementary question. Huh. So this was asked by a school student. Okay. As for school, school student. student. So, uh, one of the first instances where a school student sees tiling is when he learns the concept of area. Area, right? okay. So, take irregular shape, you tile the shape using squares, then count the squares. Right. Then you write how many squares was there. Then you say those many square units. But you can, you can tile the uh, plane using, uh, for example, regular uh, uh, triangle right. or regular hexagon. That's right. So, question is this. Why don't we use area in terms of, in the units of triangle or hexagon. Why square is more natural? Why don't we say huh. square triangle, uh, sorry, uh, square, uh, yeah. not square centimeters, yeah, it, triangle centimeters or uh, hexagon centimeters? Huh. Oh, that's basically because area, area by the way is a square, right? Volume is a cube, no? In the sense that, I mean, area, uh, you say in terms of square centimeters because area is, uh, you, as you know, I mean, length, for instance, you don't say square. <laughs> length is a linear thing, and area is a quadratic expression. Volume is a cubic expression, and so on. That's why you say square, square centimeters, I suppose, right? I mean, am I right? Yeah, I think, well... I, I don't I know mean, if that's the... It, it, the area is a product area, area of two quantities. Yeah, yeah. Area is a product of two quantities. Yeah. Two quantity, lengths. That's what. Length so, uh, so, what else can you use? Yeah. Apart from centimeter square? Yeah. You can't... So, okay, maybe maybe we can discuss this over yeah. coffee. Yeah, I think uh, so. Yeah. So one, so just one uh, quick. Uh, maybe we can have a, a last question. And uh, there are so as I said, there was a exhibition called Mathematics of Planet Earth earlier. We had some of the exhibits which were related to tessellation or, or tiling, and some of those are sitting outside there for you guys to play around with. Please, please, please don't try to take the tiles away. We have already lost All a right. lot. All right. Uh, so, but, but if you want to just try out a few things, uh, there are nice things to play around. So you can have coffee and also play around with tiling outside. Tiling, uh, yeah. But okay, so let's go with the last question now. And, uh, uh, yeah, on the spherical geometry, you mentioned that there are infinite, every polygon, uh, there are infinite number of ways to go from one point to the other. You said there are infinite number of geodesics, right? Infinite number of geodesics, right? I would have assumed that on a sphere, you have only two ge geodesics between any two points. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, so how do you get oh, the, the infinite? No, no. Okay, so I can tell you this. I'll just write the picture. Yeah, why do you show? I, I don't, I don't exactly understand what your question was, but nevertheless, I think I understand it to an extent. So from any two points, let's say from this point to this point, so 
you draw this geodesic. That's one of them, correct? Yeah. And what you do is if you can continue this along and come here, the, the whole thing is actually a geodesic. So you could also go to this point from like this. You have more than one geodesic. Whereas on the Euclidean plane from this point to this point, just one straight line, that's it. So on the uh, saddle geometry, then you have in... Uh, oh, saddle geometry... How many uh, geodesics between two points? Uh, it depends on the what you want, what, what kind of surface is you are like looking more, at. Is it more, uh, it's more than uh, one? No, no, it's, Not in, it's, it's in fact uh, just one. Exactly, oh. between two points, there is exactly one exactly geodesic one. which okay. minimizes the distance, that's it, that's about okay. it. Right. In, in, in hyperbolic geometry, but the thing is that it depends on what kind of space you are looking at, <laughs> so it's fine. But, but it's only one, yeah. What I mean is surfaces, yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, so now we will, there is coffee outside, but before we go for coffee, let's thank Arvinda for a great lecture and... Uh